This presentation is about the management of seizures. We are going to look at nomenclature, we're going to look at pathophysiology, and address all the possible therapies that are available. My name is Dr. Chauvet. I'm a board-certified neurologist working at Alta Vista Animal Hospital, a VCA branch. This picture exemplifies what needs to happen with seizures. We need to have the contact, the communication. So if we look at a patient that cannot speak and only express itself by its actions, an owner that is overseeing, and of course you who is involved in examining and relating to the patient, we must make sure that everybody is educated on what seizures are, what is going to happen or not happen, and what you're going to do when you're needed, when things aren't going the way you expect them to be. So proper logs, proper education to the client, and the referring vet in certain cases is crucial for success. Terminology. We're looking at convulsion seizures, recurrent seizures, more than one, epilepsy, which we'll define, pre-ictus, the phase before the actual seizure, the ictus, which is a seizure, post-ictus, the phase after the seizure, Grand mal, better known as big bad if you translate it. Petit mal, which is often misused, we'll talk about that. Partial focal seizures, complex partial seizures, myoclonus, and status epilepticus. Epilepsy is more than one seizure due to brain etiology. That means not metabolic, not toxic. Can be tumor, can be idiopathic, can be immune mediated, can be inherited. Petit mal is an absence seizure, so there are no motor activity going on. Not to be confused with partial complex or partial focal seizures, which are often mislabeled as petit mal, looking as a smaller expression of the grand mal, which is inaccurate. Partial complex seizures are focally impaired awareness seizures. They last about one to two minutes. Seizures can have an aura, and these seizures usually have automatisms. We talk of people, for example, picking up their clothes, fumbling, lip smacking, and they have sort of a complex set of movements that are expressed during the process. They can become unaware of their surroundings, but they look like they're aware, they're wandering, uh, so they're not losing ability to walk around like at the grand mall. There are no full body convulsions. Myoclonus, it twitches, jerks, or seizures that have sudden muscle contractions or lapses of contractions. They happen often during sleep as well, or rest. Status epilepticus is when the single epileptic seizure lasts more than five minutes or two or more seizures are noted with, within a five minute period without the person or animal returning to normal in between them. They are a state of emergency. This is what the brain would look like. It's important to realize that when you have seizures in an animal or a person, you're not going to see the animal person seizure all the time. Yet, we do an electroencephalograms and we're going to see activity in the brain. So here's what happens. You have the seizure focus and then if you look further in the brain, everything is quiet. By the way, this is Victoria Falls, at least a very smidgen of it that um, is in Zimbabwe, on the Zimbabwe side. The process of epilepsy and seizures is balanced amongst multiple pathophysiological mechanisms. Perhaps the best known one is a loss of inhibition. We talk about GABA receptors, GABA being an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So that is one of the big focuses of the anticonvulsant therapy is working with GABA receptors. As well, you have an excess in excitation. You can also have, uh, say, glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. You also have problems with ionic channels and balances. And of course, you're going to have things like calcium, which can cause quite a bit of toxicity to the cell when the channels are disbalanced. And of course, you have the balance between all of them. Um, we have the regulating factors that will potentially these channels and potentiates the GABA receptor and the calcium channels. A couple of terms to realize when we talk about seizures and we're going to deal with refractory seizures. You have secondary epileptogenesis and kindling. So in this example of again Zimbabwe, which is a bunch of antelope in the front that are going to re represent a part of the brain, and then another group of animals, the zebras in the back, which represent another part of the brain. When you have 
activity in one part of the brain, it can actually recruit another part of the brain. So for example, here we are watching these animals and we kind of spook them. So the antelopes leave and the zebras follow. So this is the case of secondary epileptogenesis where one focus in the brain is triggering another distant focus into becoming epileptic as well. In Kindling, you have this video, which I will show you, again, back in Zimbabwe, one of the days I almost lost my life. We are sitting by a water hole, and there are elephants coming and drinking, and of course there's the matriarch with her little troop of females and the calves. They are right behind our wood hideout. You'll see my son in front of me in a bit. So here the example is that the matriarch is a seizure focus, and the elephants near her are the neighboring neurons. So you can see that she's getting upset and hyperactive. You will also see that the other females are kind of electing to move away and not go into this activity. Here she goes. So the neighboring neuron is not active. However, the angry matriarch is going to recruit them all into charging. And there she goes. and they are all going the same direction. No elephant was hurt, of course, you're not allowed to shoot the elephants in Zimbabwe. Yeah, and that's me panicking because my children are right there. So here's Leo. Leo is a cat that is showing some myoclonus type seizures during his sleep. So we're gonna watch that. Yeah, I would like to go back. Here's Leo. There we go. So Leo is showing some tremors and muscle activity of his legs during his sleep. And you can see that this left back leg is not affected very much. Here's a grand mal seizure, sound effects and all, with autonomic disturbance, which means Very difficult to watch. And up you go. We're now in the postictal phase. Patient lost bladder control, as you saw from the stain on the carpet, showing autonomic disturbance. This was a full grand mal. Here's a complex partial seizure. And here's another complex partial seizure. Here's a rage seizure. These are probably the scariest ones. And Sarah is right back into being conscious, aware, wondering what's going on. But we'll go through these episodes. Imitators of seizures. Here's a great example. Both of these dogs have hypertension. Once the hypertension was managed, none of these episodes were noted again. So be wary of hypertension. It's a great imitator. These are behavior issues. These are not seizures. Licking, fly biting, and circling, or tail chasing. Just be careful with the tail chasing. Make sure it's just not a circling due to midbrain disease or something of the sort. But fly biting is almost always behavioral, so do not be too quick to put them on anticonvulsants. What's the next step? Medication? Nope, not yet. So we're going to do a workup. Complete blood count is really important, including the chemistry, including the triglyceride. Thoracic radiograph, any patient four years and over, make sure no metastasis, blood pressure, as I mentioned, abdominal ultrasound if indicated by the breed.
endocrine system, thyroid, adrenal glands are always um, high on the list to check, MRI or CT, some kind of imaging, sometimes both, spinal tap and spinal fluid analysis have to be on the list as well, of course, to complete the workup. If all of this is normal, then you're left with idiopathic epilepsy and you begin your treatment with the drugs. Logs. Logs are very important. You need to make sure you have great seizure logs. You can find a ton of them on the internet. I have some as well. If you want, I can forward them. You need to consider recommending the RVC pet epilepsy tracker to your clients. This will allow them to keep their log. It also will give feedback to research to be able to manage all these dogs and we be able to track what's going on. So when do we start treatment? When there's more than one seizure? when a cause is identified. That's very much a clinician preference. As a rule of thumb, I always recommend starting treatment if you have more than one seizure every four to six weeks, or if you tend to have cluster seizures, or if the patient is having issues with uh, aggression, perhaps. So there's a few things to consider when you start seizures. Um, the goal is, of course, no seizures. Sometimes it's just getting them down to less than a seizure every four to six weeks. Sometimes it's client comfort because they just can't handle the seizures at all. Sometimes it's patients at risk. For example, aggressive seizures could be euthanized if that happens with a child. The rules of engagement for therapy, we're talking about monotherapy versus multimodal therapy. We gotta decide what type of seizures we're treating and that will often affect the medication we start with. Are there any other diseases we need to consider in our choice of medication? Owner compliance, twice a day, once a day, three times a day like Kepra. Educate your clients so they understand what they're giving and understand the consequences. For example, potassium bromide and choosing the food for the patient. Monitor and recheck regularly. Always go back to the drawing board. Always rethink what you've done. Always assume that you might have missed something. Do your homework. Plums is my friend, but you may have someone else that you use, another drug book. Phenobarbital. So let's go to our drugs. The product, the biggest one we use, of course, is phenobarbital. And it says right here, Mr. Dumpty, may cause dizziness and affect balance. So indeed, that's probably the biggest side effects of phenobarbital and probably the one that makes clients shy away from it. And of course, it's reputation of hepatotoxicity, which may be a little bit aggressive of reputation because I'm not so sure it causes hepatotoxicity, perhaps more of uh, predisposes the liver two issues. So mechanism, it affects the GABA receptors and it potentiates GABA. It inhibits a reuptake and of calcium at high dosages. And the peak levels occur at four to eight hours. Half-life is 12 to 125 hours in a dog. Average 49 hours overall is what I tell people. So you're going to measure the levels at, two and a, at a five and a half half-life. So that's gonna put you in about two to three weeks. Metabolized in the liver, it's excreted unchanged, about 25% of it renally. Alkaline urine will increase the excretion, so remember that. The dose is two and a half to five milligrams per kilogram, depending on who you're dealing with. I personally start these idiopathic dogs at five megs per keg. If I have a seizure that's due to cancer or something immune, then I probably will go on the low end of that dose, about two and a half or three milligrams per kilogram. The levels are done in about two weeks if you're dosing at less than three megs per keg. If you're dosing over three megs per keg, you measure in three weeks. You do it at trough, very important, and fasted. Um, the key thing here to remember is to simplify your life, just say three weeks. And remember, you need to check liver panel at the same time of phenobarb. I advise a base bile acid, even though it's fasted, and a free T4. Phenobarb can affect the thyroid, and yes, the free T4 can go down as well, but not as fast as the T4, so I keep an eye on the free T4. If the free T4 is low, then I recommend doing a TSH at that point. Levels are at any changes of dosages, nutrition changes, and other illnesses need to be repeated about two to three weeks after those changes have happened. After that, it's about once a year that I do the levels. Side effects can have respiratory, increased panting, anemia, bone marrow suppression in cats can occur. It's rare, but it can happen. Hepatopathy can be seen. You can see cutaneous lesions as well as a reflection of that. You can consider the ARCFOS and ALT to be four times normal. Um, the EST can also be increased, 
anxiety, PUPD, of course, it's a polyuria first and a polydipsia to follow. They get a little too hungry, sedation, ataxia is very common in cats. Watch out with other drugs, non-steroidals, rifampin, comfenicol, most of the drugs actually that will affect uh, cytochrome P450 and affect the liver. So here's some question. I heard phenobarb will cause my dog's liver to fail. Uh, yeah, it can happen, but it's probably not that common. If you keep an eye on the liver and you're a diligent clinician, you probably won't have to deal with this very much. Often recommend as well people use milk thistle or other liver protectant at the same time. Can I stop phenobarb now that my dog has no more seizures? Uh, no, you cannot. You have to wean it off, and I can certainly help you with cocktails, but overall 20-25% every six weeks is a nice slow wean. If you're having a complication, need to go faster, you can wean off as fast as every day, decrease a little bit more, or every couple of days, as long as you've added another anticonvulsant. You can take a normal dog that's been on high doses of anticonvulsants for a period of time and just take off the anticonvulsant phenobarbital and it will begin to seizure. The reason is a sudden shift in, poten in um, the basic threshold and the basic resting potential of the membrane. Can I stop the phenobarb now that I've added another medication? Uh, no, you cannot. The phenobarb stays on. We would only remove phenobarb if it was a complication. Adding medication means the first one was not enough. You just have to add another one, not just trade. Occasionally we trade, but most of the time we just add. Potassium bromide. Well, potassium bromide, I have this image because it causes psychosis in people, so you have to be careful. Um, not big a problem in kids, but in adults can cause psychosis. So bromide versus chloride is an exchange of the ions and is hyperpolarization of the membrane as the negative ion is called into the membrane. So remember with seizures and with cells in general, we're not talking about any cells becoming positive. We're talking about cells becoming less negative and therefore firing off when they shouldn't. The half-life is about 25 days in dog, 10 days in cat. So depending on the dietary salt, of course. So you're looking at measuring levels roughly about six months down the road. And I say six months because we're going to ignore the cats. Cats really shouldn't be getting bromide. They have lots of issues with it. So it's mostly a dog uh, kind of therapy here. It's excreted by the kidneys. So kidney function is pretty relevant here. Levels in six weeks is what I do in order to make sure I am on track. But really six months is plenty. 20 to 40 milligram per kilogram one a day. Yes, there's a correlation with bromide and the toxic signs. So when you see a drunken dog and then you're definitely in a toxic dose and you can decrease your bromide versus phenobarb that almost all dogs get a little drunk in the beginning of taking the drug. Uh, by the way, when you talk of phenobarbital, there is a linear correlation between phenobarbital dose and levels. So if you want to double the level, you just double the dose. This is why it's so important. Not really the same correlation with bromide. So the loading dose, lots of people ask me about a loading dose. They come from left and right. There's really no one loading dose that's better than the other in my book. The one I use is the one that was defined by Schwartz Forscher, who was one of the sort of grandmothers of neuro in uh, Europe. And Schwartz used three times the dose on the first day, so 75 milligrams per kilogram the first day, and then after that we go to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. Side effects, sedation can cause polyphagia, pulmonitis in cats, death or no, no, pancreatitis occasionally in dogs. The biggest issue in dogs is usually gastritis and irritation of the lining of the stomach. So I do recommend giving a meal first or with it so it will ease off on that. Caution with chloride, for example, the diet salt and fluid. So if you have a dog coming on emergency for something else and it's on bromide, if you put it on saline at twice maintenance, you will actually drop the half-life of bromide from 25 days to about 48 hours. So you're going to run into complications pretty quickly. Levetiracetam. It's a very popular drug here in Canada and also in the States. I think what people love about levetiracetam is the minimal side effects that it has. We don't really understand its mechanism very well and still to this day. The half-life is about two to five hours. It peaks at about two hours. This is why it has to be given three times a day. So this whole fallacy of decreasing it twice a day and thinking that's going to do the trick is probably not right. We're taking risk with patients when we do that. We give 20 milligram per kilogram TID. Uh, the dose for uh, toxicity is pretty high, so you have a lot of margin of error. You can go ahead and kick 
you know, you can kick that dosage all the way to 80 megs per keg TID if you want to. Um, you're not going to run into any problems. There are really no levels to do and there's no correlation with the levels and the dose, so we don't really bother with that. Side effects are little to none, sedation, lethargy sometimes, vomiting occasionally, it's pretty rare, toxic levels, as I said, uh, 1200 milligram per kilogram per day, and that's when you're going to run into issues. So you have a great margin of increasing that drug if you need to. Um, I don't think it's better to take a TID into a BID by increasing the BID dose. It certainly is a compensation and clients demand that and I've been caught doing it, but it's not really advised. Again, not in the best interest of managing the seizures and the yo-yo effect that goes in the brain. Phenobarb and non-steroidals, they can be some drug interactions, so watch for those. Topiramate. Topiramate is a great drug for dogs like this dog, which has partial focal seizures. Topiramate is probably one of the first drugs that I like to use for partial focal seizures. So last time I spoke, I was told it's not available in Canada, but apparently I'm able to find it online, so I'm sure it's around somewhere. I do like Topamax quite a bit. Top mechanisms. So we're looking at looking at usage of it partial seizure. It's very short half-life. We tend to give it three times a day as well. In cats, it can be given twice a day. It's a little bit better half-life. It seems to antagonize NMDA receptors and NMPA receptors, and it increases the frequency of GABA and activates the GABA receptors. Side effects are GI, of course, like most drugs, sedation in cats, anorexia also in cats, which can be a big deal. Question mark whether it actually can lead to glaucoma. There's no strong proof of that. Kidney stones is one of the potential side effects of topiramate. So we have to watch out for this, make sure there's plenty of hydration. Some of the drugs to avoid, of course, tricyclic antidepressants and are very important. Benzodiazepine. So benzodiazepines are fantastic drugs. So we use them since the the starting of knowing how to manage seizures. The problem is they don't really work well in dogs except in status epilepticus where we give it rectally or nasally or IV. Um, so it is not a good drug to use in dogs for long-term management of seizures orally. It's good for sedation though. In cats, however, we love diazepam and benzodiazepine for cats for seizure management. It tends to work beautifully. Unfortunately, it's not very used. Um, there's a concern with liver disease with cats and diazepam. I think um, I think it's underused for cats. I think it should be used a bit more often. Just again, same thing, manage the liver. It an ant antagonizes a serotonin and it potentiates the GABA activity, decreasing the release of acetylcholine in the central nervous system. The peak levels occur fairly quickly in dogs and it's a very much eliminated uh, within minutes. Um, so in a dog, if you're giving injectable diazepam, it's going to be pretty much out of the system within 20 minutes, so you don't have a lot of time, but certainly enough to manage the status. You must give very slow, and there's certainly Dara Gottlieb in a hospital recommends having a separate catheter for giving any diazepam in a CRI in order to avoid phlebitis and problems. If it goes uh, perivascularly, it can be quite an issue in damage. The dose is about a half to one meg per keg. I find myself not having the time to weigh the dogs when they come on status, so I kind of jump into the size where I'll give a chihuahua, I'll give him a CC, and a uh, great day, and I'll give him the bottle, which is 10 cc's and sort of judge in between Labrador 7 cc's, Cocker 4 or 5 cc's depending on the size and you kind of go with that. Um, seems to be a little bit more than at 0.5 mex per keg but it does a really good job. You're not going to kill the dog with Dajapam so but you do need to stop the seizures and stop them well. The CRI is excellent for use. It can be given in a D5W or directly in a syringe pump. Just remember that it's inactivated by light and plastic, so you must uh, make sure you cover it and don't try to draw a day's worth of phenobar of uh, diazepam at once and leave it sitting there. It's best to only use two to three hours at a time. Cats, the dose is about half of that of the dogs and is quite effective. So in a cat with a seizure, I would use a half to one cc of diazepam. 
Hepatotoxicity in cat can occur chronically, so it may not be the best choice over years, but it certainly can be a good choice initially. Avoid in aggressive patient. It can actually cause a reverse effect, or it can cause of sedation, can actually cause excitation. That's why we recommend that. Uh, sedation, polyphagia, of course, appetite, ataxia, aggression, and agitation can be a consequence of the diazepam and any benzodiazepine. Be careful with tricyclic antidepressant, piggyback with any other drug that affects the liver. Lorazepam is one that's used a lot in people, not so much for us. And of course, clonazepam and clorazepate are other ones. The bioavailability uh, is a little lower in other di benzodiazepine than, um, than diazepam itself. Clonazepam, for example, here's a dose, and clorazepate, here is your dose as well. Clorazepate can lead to phobias, so you have to be careful. But of course, you all know we use trancine quite a bit in dogs. Um, a little bit lower in cats, of course, benzodiazepine rule is half the dose in cats and in dogs. Let's talk about gabapentin, which really is not used a lot in seizures anymore. Um, it was sort of the black sheep that was redirected towards the pain management. And there's still great controversy about what the actual right dose is for pain management anyways. But the dose for seizures is roughly about 20 milligram per kilogram, three times a day to four times a day. So it gets metabolized quite quickly, half of that in the cat. And we're looking at 80% bioavailable within the peak of about two hours. Hours. Um, we don't really measure levels with gabapentin either. The mechanism we think is by binding the calcium voltage channels and uh, decreasing the influx of calcium. So we don't think that it affects the GABA binding that much and the reuptake degradation of its antagonist to GABA. The analgesic preventing the allodynia and the hyperalgesia is very well known and I gotta be honest I don't know last time I used GABA for seizure management um, certainly use it every day for pain management. Cause sedation, taxia, careful with renal patients of course, there is a withdrawal period to be forewarned when you use these dogs for pain management long term can cause an issue. Um, and the rats has been shown to increase pancreatic cancer. Zonisamide is an excellent drug as well. I don't use it as much, but I know that previous neurologists at Alta Vista were quite fond of it, especially as a combination drug. Its uh, mechanism is unknown, 70% bioavailability. The half-life is 15 hours, so it's quite long. And in cats, about 33 hours, even longer. Uh, the dose is 5 to 10 milligram per kilogram, 5 in the cat. And so as far as when the level of the drug is going to be in a steady state, it's going to be in quite a while, and giving it twice a day, therefore, is quite easy and not a problem. And it makes it more convenient for the owners. It's not... Um, you don't want to give if you have any sulfonamide reactions. It can cause sedaxia, uh, sedation and ataxia, which if you mix together the two words, you get sedaxia, which is kind of weird. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, GI signs, anorexia, and lethargy in cats. And of course, uh, you want to be careful with phenobarb because the clearance of the nisamide is affected by phenobarbital. Felbamate. So felbamate both works on a potassium channel and as well antagonizes glutamate. It also has an effect on potentiation of GABA activity. Complex partial seizures are best treated with felbamate. Reduction, it reduces excitatory neurotransmission. It's excreted by the kidneys. Half-life is 5 to 14 hours. The dose is 3 times a day at 15 mg per keg. A higher dose is if it is not the sole drug. Almost no side effects with felbamate, except for possibly KCS, some liver changes, tremors, salivation, agitation. Uh, watch out when you use it with phenobarb. There's a drug in Europe that's becoming quite popular there, but we don't have access to it yet, and it potentiates GABA. It's called amipitoin, and it's about 92% bioavailable. It's given twice a day, which is also convenient. And um, it seems to have not many side effects at all, except for ataxia and a little bit of nystagmus at times. So I'm hoping we'll see that drug on our market very soon. Great controversy is CBD. So we're talking about pot here. We're talking, is the pot needed in our pot? Well, um, the oils that are being created are their derivatives of cannabis 
do not have the THC, so do not have the toxic component to our pets. And there are certainly studies out there that Colorado and all that are being done and looking at the effects of uh, these derivatives on seizure management. Not only these are proven to be very good for seizure management, but also proven to be very good for pain management, appetite stimulants, and so on. So I think we'll see more of that in the future as cannabis becomes more legalized, that we'll be getting access to those. Unfortunately, there's a small detail at least in the United States, cannabis and any of its products, uh, derivatives of marijuana of any type that includes the oils are considered class one and veterinarians cannot get a class one DEA license. So I'm not sure how Canada deals with that at this time because we don't have DEA license here, but I would love to see these used more for pain management and as well for seizure management. And of course for cats, it's a great appetite stimulant. So hopefully we'll see more of this in the future. Acupuncture is fantastic for helping with seizure management. Unfortunately, it has to be done on a long-term basis. It's not going to be the sole thing. Um, it will work in the right hands with some patients, not all patients. Is it worth a try? Yes. Do I think it should be the number one treatment? Absolutely not. Gold beads, those do not really work in my opinion. They used to be quite trendy and unfortunately the gold beads are not all gold. They're put in acupoints and uh, hopefully continue stimulating those points over time and the idea is that as you pet the dog and deal with the dog or the dog moves and it gives stimulation and I, I don't believe in them so, but again I'm sure there's some people who swear by them. Ketogenic diets. This is same as potassium bromide, something that's extremely efficient in management of seizures in kids and is becoming to show promises with dogs. As a matter of fact, there's a diet by Purina release that claims being ketogenic and helping with seizure management. So ketogenic diet, the, pro, the basic principle is really high fat, moderate protein, and very low carbohydrates. You're going to go ahead and feed these diets and exclusively these diets to these patients and help uh, so Sort of decrease that seizure threshold and make it impossible for um, change the seizure threshold, make it impossible for the seizures to fire off. It's working tremendously well in kids and it's worked very well in many of my patients, being able to wean them off their anticonvulsant to a certain degree. It is a huge commitment to the owners and being, of course, um, derivative of or formula similar to the Atkins diet can lead to weight loss. There is formulas available out there. I have created one and there are books out there that are available if people want to cook for their dog and do this. The principles is of course no gluten, no processed food and even things like bacon has to be side pork and not actual bacon. Um, so you have to be quite diligent on what you put or you're basically ruining the diet and it's not going to work. So I recommend looking into that for those refractory dogs. What if the therapy fails? So you have to go back. Go back to the drawing board. Did I do the workup? Did I treat with the right drug? Did I address the right problems? Did I address the client's compliance? Did the doctor uh, pay attention, listen to the refractory seizures and treat aggressively enough early enough? Any errors in pharmacy, change of pharmacy, change of formula of the drug, any other ailments I started up, this dog now all of a sudden have IBD and therefore absorption is affected, medications uh, being issued for other things and are interfering with treatment. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Sometimes with these refractory dogs it takes a lot of creativity, it takes a lot of time to go ahead and plan the next step. So with compliance, we're looking at clients, clients that don't give the drug on time, don't give the right amount of the drug, don't want to give the drug, tell you which drug you should give, and that can become quite a problem. Wrong diagnosis, well here's a dog treated for seizures and then begins developing this clinical signs. Aimless pacing, circling, getting stuck in corners. So these clinical signs are typical of a dog that now has intracranial disease, and obviously we missed the diagnosis. That dog needs a workup. Underlying problems? Well, this dog probably didn't get his blood pressure taken. And when we did get her and took her blood pressure, we realized that her seizures were due to hypertension. We managed her, worked her up, treated her Cushing's, and life went all happy ever again after. 
there are some mystical things that affect seizures, and this is a touchy topic, um, probably touchier than cannabis, but um, do full moons actually affect seizures? I believe they do for some patients. I don't think they do for all patients, but there are some patients that get influenced by it. And if you see a pattern, you should not ignore it. For the patients that I have that tend to seizure more on new moons and full moons, what I tend to do is give the dose of medication, let's pick phenobarb, instead of twice a day, give it three times a day, a couple of days before the new moon or full moon, until a couple of days after, and then resume the twice a day. And that seems to keep things at bay. Barometric pressure, a problem in Florida, and of course problem everywhere around the world, but for us we have changes in barometric pressure that can be quite drastic with hurricane time, and this is something to also consider as affecting the seizures. Um, difficult to manage, but I wish tell clients to look at those factors to see if there's any relationship. Managing seizures is an art. And for those who don't know, you've got Sigmund Freud and Salvador Dali in front of you. So it is definitely an art and it's going to take a lot of juggling and a lot of understanding of multifactorial processes that will involve owner, patient, pharmacy. Now that you're done, if you don't mind, just go ahead and send me an email. And the email should be sent to my VCA email and on that I would like to have three questions on what you do not understand and also three comments of something you understood and helped you out during this lecture. It'd be fantastic if you could do that this way I can evaluate if we're doing our job and of course help you out with yours.